You can join me in opening your Bibles to the letter of James. If you don't have a Bible near you, that's on page 1011 in the Bibles that are underneath the chairs around the room. Um, And I just want to note that uh, the elders had a retreat this uh, weekend, and so there'll be a picture up here of uh, the men who serve as elders in this church, and I just want to share with you that it was a great time. We loved being able to reflect together, looking backward on what God has done in our church life this past year and number of years, and to thank God for all the stories we were able to share of the way that God's at work in you all and through you all, and then also look ahead with some planning and some praying and some uh, thinking about the future, so we'll share more about that um, over time in different ways, but um, the words that Uh, come to my mind that mark our time together um, in general, but certainly at this retreat, are um, respect and affection and fun. So I just want you to know that um, from my vantage point, uh, these are faithful brothers. They love you. uh, They rest in God's love, and we have a blast together. So um, that was this past weekend. So as you pray for Um, us, you can have that in mind as well. Well, we're continuing our series in the book of James, and what we're seeing here is that the main problem that James is addressing in the group of Christians he's writing to is the problem of dividedness. So we can be double-minded, have divided loyalties, divided relationships, and so forth. And in our text today, James addresses another kind of dividedness, and this is the danger of dividing hearing from doing. He's addressing the problem of those who hear God's Word and don't do it. He's challenging the issue of inconsistency in the lives of Christians. This is an urgent topic for us. This is one reason many people reject Christianity and don't even give it a hearing. They see inconsistency or hypocrisy in the lives of professing Christians. They find out one of their co-workers is a Christian, maybe the only only Christian they know. And then over time, they see a massive inconsistency in their claim to follow Jesus and how they actually live and treat others. And so they want nothing to do with that. Francis Schaeffer addressed this problem a generation ago. He wrote that Christianity is both the truth that God has spoken, so we must listen and learn it, but it also has to change us. And so he wrote, a dead, ugly orthodoxy with no real spiritual reality must be rejected as sub-Christian. There is nothing more ugly in all the world, nothing that turns people aside than dead orthodoxy. So we take this seriously and we need to. Of course, sometimes people have wrong expectations. Christians won't be perfect. We are imperfect people clinging to a perfect Christ. But we're also being perfected by Christ. The gap between our professed belief and our lived experience and reality and practice should narrow over time. So this problem isn't new. James is writing to Christians in about the mid-40s A.D., so the church is in its infancy, and already James is addressing this issue. And his point is this, Christians must not just hear, but truly receive and do God's Word. Christians must be both hearers and doers. This is what will make our profession not only credible in the world, but powerful in our generation. So let's read James chapter 1, verses 19 through 25. And as a reminder, this is God's very word to us that we are now going to hear. And even in keeping with what we read here, we want to receive this and then be leaning in to consider how we can do this. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. 
For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this word, and we recognize that for us to be uh, those who rightfully hear and receive your word and respond to it with doing, we need your Spirit's work, and we need to be transformed even here by the hearing of your word. So help us understand this word and listen and be changed with intent to do, and we pray that you would fulfill those good resolves in the coming days. In Jesus' name, amen. So Christians must not just hear, but truly receive and then do God's Word. That's the point. And there's two paragraphs here. They focus on receiving God's Word and then doing God's Word. So two questions. How do we receive God's Word? How do we do God's Word? Not complicated. First, how do we receive God's Word? Verses 19 through 21 give us a cluster of commands here, and they may seem somewhat disconnected at first. You just glance at those, be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, put away moral filthiness and wickedness, receive God's Word. I never saw how these are connected or why James says these here until this past week. There seems to be one main thing that James is aiming at in all of this. He's aiming at a single concern. He wants Christians at the outset of this letter to receive God's Word. And so he's addressing a cluster of issues in their lives that are keeping them from doing that. So these are barriers to truly listening, hearing, and receiving God's Word. So let's think this through together because all of us need to see that this may be going on in our lives to some degree here. And some of you really need to hear this this morning. Notice the flow of thought here. First, look at what he said right before this section. We saw this last week in verse 18. He said that God brought us forth by the word of truth. So this is referring to the new birth, the doctrine of regeneration, the gift of the new heart. Do you see how God causes us to be born again? It's by the word of of truth. So we hear God's true word about Christ Jesus, and God takes that word and by the Holy Spirit gives us new life, gives us a new heart, and we trust Him. So if you've become a Christian, this has happened to you. You heard the good news of Jesus, or you read it, or you remembered hearing it or reading it before, and God took that word in a moment through His own desire, and He caused it to give you new life. Now, in light of this, what are then the the commands here of verses 19 to 21 doing here? These are all issues that can keep us from receiving God's Word. Notice he goes immediately into giving a number of commands, and they're all headed toward the last one in verse 21. Receive with meekness the implanted Word, which is able to save your souls. So, do you see what's on his mind here? He's saying God gave you new life through his word, and that word is planted in you. So now as a Christian, as one who has God's word planted within you, receive it with meekness. Embrace it. Let it have its effect on you. And then he goes on to say, be not just a hearer, but a doer of God's word. So receive the implanted word, hear God's word, do God's word. Because he caused you to be born again by God's word. So what are the other commands then? in verses 19 and 21 doing here. These are the basic issues in our lives that can keep us from growing in Christ. So he's saying, you've been regenerated by the word. Now you need to let this word cause you to grow. But it's not working well in some of your lives. You have issues in your life that are blocking you from truly receiving and doing God's word. You have a certain attitude in life. You have certain sinful tendencies in your life that you have to get rid of and receive God's Word. So what are these barriers to being a hearer and doer of God's Word? Well, first, verse 19. 
Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. So he's saying you need to hear more, speak less, and restrain your anger. Because if you're the kind of person who doesn't listen, who always speaks, and who often gets angry, you're not going to be the kind of person who can receive God's word. You are closed off to wisdom and input. You're too busy talking over everyone else in life. You're too quickly bothered and frustrated by things rather than just letting ideas you may not agree with settle in you so you can consider them reasonably. You aren't able to calm down, have self-control, and listen. You're good at telling other people their problems and talking about all the problems in the world, but you're not good at humbly listening to what your problems might be. Some of you are like this, and you know it. Some of you are like this, and you don't know it. Some of you have obvious issues in here. The people close to you are on eggshells, or they're often looking for the exit ramp in conversation when they can move away from the incessant word flow because you keep talking, or they no longer bother to ever bring up things that they know you'll disagree with because it never goes well. You're not open-minded, and you're mainly criticizing and blaming other people. And this posture of not listening to others and just having a posture of not being the kind of person who listens is keeping you from receiving God's Word, even if you're here Sunday after Sunday, and even if you open your Bible every morning. You're not humbly open to a voice outside of yourself correcting you. Another issue that blocks us from receiving God's Word is obvious or pervasive sin. James refers to this here as filthiness, like moral filthiness, and rampant wickedness. So some of you, um, and I don't have people in my mind, by the way, I'm saying that because in a room this size, (laughs) it's true. Some of you um, have some obvious sins in your life, and uh, they're not complicated to get out of your life. You, of course, can't do it in your own strength. You need God's help, but with His help, you can stop. You can take radical steps to cut off that relationship, to begin to kill that addiction, online addiction, to cut off drunkenness from your life. And all of this is moving toward the final note in verse 21. And receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. So you need to quiet your heart in life Stop speaking so much. Stop getting angry and frustrated at everything. And humbly receive God's word. And this word is able to save you. Now that may sound confusing. This is not written, this letter is not written to non-Christians, those who don't know Jesus yet. It's not written to teach them how they can become Christians This is written to believers, and he says that God's word is able to save them. So how do we need to be saved if we're already saved? Well, this can be confusing to us because modern Christians tend to use the word save to refer exclusively to the beginning of the Christian life. But the New Testament uses salvation language to refer to the whole of our salvation that we're in the middle of right now. Past, present, and future is the whole of salvation. James probably has that future aspect mainly in view here, when we'll be finally brought into God's presence in the new creation. This is like how Paul spoke elsewhere. So Romans 13, 11, in in a letter that mainly emphasizes, um, at least in the first half, our already salvation, our justification, being declared righteous before God, though we're sinners because of Jesus. He says this, salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. You first believed, and salvation is out there. It's drawing nearer. Future aspect. He encouraged a pastor named Timothy this way. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Why does a pastor need to keep a close watch on his own life and on his teaching? 
He says, persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Is Timothy not a Christian? He needs to save? No. And is he saved by this work of keeping a close watch? No. This is the future aspect of our salvation, the completion of our salvation. So the Christian life is like a marathon. We enter the race in the past, we run it in the present, and we'll finish in the future. And so James is saying, keep receiving God's Word with humility as you run, because it will continue to lead you toward the completion of your salvation. So let's summarize here. James is saying, Christian brothers and sisters, there is a basic posture that you need to embrace in your life in order to grow as Christians. You need to be able to listen. You need to quit talking so much. You need to quit letting your temper flare up. You need to get rid of unchecked and obvious sins in your life and receive God's Word. And this is for all of us. Notice verse 19. He begins by saying, let every person do this. So there's no exceptions for certain personalities, right? We should never say, uh, well, you know, Sam, uh, he kind of gets heated sometimes. And, it's, you know, get, you get used to it. Or Joe's a bit of a prickly personality, but you get used to it. No, these are basics for Christians. If you have a problem here, you have to address this. And this is something that every Christian needs to hear. In varying degrees, this may be what's keeping you from growing more as a Christian to become more like Jesus. We all need to cultivate this posture of listening and receiving. We need to be open to God's Word. For some of you, this is a bigger issue in your life than you even realize. You're here on Sundays. Maybe you listen to Bible podcasts through the week. Maybe you like theology books. And maybe you are a true Christian. But you are also in a season of life where God's Word is not actually getting into the depths of who you are and changing you, and you're not doing it. It's going in your ears, but you have these barriers to t taking root right now because you are not slow to listen. You are slow to listen, quick to speak, quick to become angry. You've got some unchecked sin in your life, and this is keeping you from actually embracing God's Word and changing right now. So you need to listen more, talk less, control your anger, get rid of whatever's pervasive in your life with sin. And you need to look to God, get low before Him, and open yourself to His Word. So this is how we receive God's Word. And James is eager at the outset to address this. Be hearers of the Word, receiving God's Word with a posture of humble openness. So that's the first question. Now the second question, how do we do God's Word? This is the point of verse 22. But be doers of the Word and not hearers only. And then he illustrates this and what it's like if you're a hearer and not a doer. He says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself, and he goes away, and at once forgets what he looked like. So a man sees himself in a mirror, maybe he sees something that needs to get fixed, something in his teeth, something on his shirt, and then he goes away, and he forgets to do anything about it. He forgot what he saw. Superficial glance, moving on, forgets all about it. This is like you and me, if we hear a sermon, sermon on Sunday morning, and then we do nothing about it, thinking that by just being here and hearing a sermon, that's doing something important. But if you're not going to do anything about it, what was the point in being here? So this is like collecting the sermon in a cup, feeling good because you held out the cup and collected it, and then on your way to the car, you just kind of dump it on the bush. Just empty it back out and go on your way. Is that not how it might sometimes feel for you? There might be a number of reasons for this, but some of this, and a lot of this, is in your control. It's how you're hearing. Are you leaning in? Do you have these barriers in your life that, that's keeping you from engaging and being humbly open to God's Word? Are you actively thinking, I need to hear this and do this? Is there something here for me? Growing Christians and humble Christians are easily edified. It doesn't take a lot of God's Word for them to get active and busy doing. 
if you really struggle to find something to do in light of God's Word, I may be a terrible preacher, but at least the method that we have here is to open God's Word and read it and give it. I may not do a great job about that, but there's stuff here, even if I'm not good at this, for you to receive and go do. Um, So, like looking at a mirror and just forgetting what you see. The opposite is in verse 25. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So James is probably referring to God's law, probably all of Scripture here, as it's come to its perfect fulfillment in Jesus. And we now receive God's word as fulfilled in Christ and we live it out. And his law leads to freedom. This is because God's word is the story of how God sets us free from our selfishness. And his commands are for our good because they guide us into our fullest, truest humanity and becoming like Jesus. And as we hear and do God's word, we become more like him, more truly human, more how we were meant to be. And this emphasis on hearing and doing that James is giving here, where did he get this, do you think? A lot of what we hear in James came from Jesus. So look at Matthew 7, 24, and 26. should be on the screen. Everyone then, and just listen to the echoes of, uh, in James' teaching from this. Everyone then who hears these words of mine, Jesus says, and does them, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, so hearing but not doing, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Luke 8, 21, Jesus says this. His family's kind of gathering outside of a home that he's teaching in. I'm like, hey, your, your mother and brothers and family are outside. And he says this, my mother and my brothers, my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. John 13, 17, he speaks to his disciples and he says, if you know these things, if you've heard them, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So the point is fairly straightforward, but did you notice here that James warns against self-deception? Look again at verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, and we may think straightforward, basic, check, deceiving yourselves. So there's a particular tendency to be self-deceived about this matter, which means some of us may be self-deceived about this this morning. But the problem is, if this is you, you may not know it. You're thinking about how this sermon is really good for the person sitting next to you, and you're glad you both came this morning. Or you're thinking about someone else in this room, or someone who's not in this room that should have been here to hear this message. Or you're thinking, this is for my parents. So in what ways might you or I be self-deceived about this? Well, you may think that because you are hearing the word regularly that you're doing it. Now that may sound kind of ridiculous at first, right? No, we know hearing and doing are different. But I think this is common and it's a temptation for us. Think about it. Sometimes we can read the Bible, study the Bible, learn about it, and then feel good and like complete because we did that and we learned something. And then we go on with our day. I'll go on with my day because I'm essentially believing that hearing God's word is the thing I'm supposed to be doing. But then when I read it and it says to do something, I translate that not into a command to do, but something I'm to learn about what I'm to do. I've learned about these great commands that I'm to do. Check. I've learned. For example, a very common part of the Bible is the Beatitudes that we read this morning. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the peacemakers. Those may sound very familiar. You may really like them. You may have studied them before. But Don Carson once made this observation. He said that everyone thinks that they live out the Beatitudes simply because they know them and like them. He said the astonishing thing is that many people, because they are vaguely familiar with the Beatitudes, actually think 
they are more or less living them. So this means that there's a real danger in listening to a lot of sermons. How many sermons can you take in and actually do? Right? We don't want um, our hearing God's Word to outpace our doing of God's Word. One person who got this point uh, said this to me. He said that he doesn't listen to any other sermons other than the sermon in his local church on Sunday morning because he said he has enough to do and change in his life with one sermon a week. He doesn't need more sermons to hear and then disobey. It's too much hearing, too little doing. Now, I am all for more sermons, more Bible study, more teaching, more Bible reading, and some sermons, you know that's the point that I'm mainly driving at um, and commending that. But this morning, I'm emphasizing the real danger. We can end up just getting puffed up with more knowledge that doesn't actually change us because our hearing is outpacing our doing. And there's a real danger for someone like me in light of this text who hears and studies and teaches and preaches God's Word. The danger of self-deception for me is in thinking that God is happy simply because I'm doing this right now. But if I'm not obeying, if I'm not internalizing this through the week and under God's Word even right now, hearing it with you, then I'm self-deceived. One of the thoughts that sometimes is on my mind, right as I'm walking up here to preach, is what I read from John Calvin one time. He said that preachers must be the first to follow God's word, and he put it this way. It would be better for him, speaking of someone like me, better for him to break his neck going up into the pulpit if he does not take pains to be the first to follow God. I do not do this perfectly. I'm not here to say I've done this but I need to, I'm striving, and I want this to be the mark of my life. We're all people, none of us are doing this perfectly, but we want to take this seriously. And that kind of statement sobers me. Let me be the first in this room to do God's Word. So the point is that hearing is not enough. We must also do God's Word. So how do we take all of this and respond to it? How do we hear James 1, 19 to 25, and then do it. Here's a few implications for the morning for us to consider. First of all, I want to address those of you who don't identify as Christians. Um, and I know some of you are here, maybe you're exploring Christianity, and uh, maybe a friend invited you or a family member invited you. Um, maybe you are younger and you're growing up in a Christian home, you're in high school, um, and you're here, and you're open, you're exploring, you're not quite yet sure what you think, though. Uh, maybe you've been here for a number of years, and you're still a bit on the fence, but you're considering it. So I want to talk to you, but in particular, those of you who are not identifying as Christians, but who have real concerns about Christian hypocrisy. You've seen professing Christians living inconsistently. They say one thing, they do another. They clearly hear a lot, but then they don't seem to live it out. Maybe you're in high school and you see this in your own parents and it concerns you. Maybe you see it in other students, or maybe you're older and you've seen this in the workplace, a Christian who is inconsistent with what they profess. So I want you to hear from me this morning that you are not crazy and that that is a legitimate problem. The Bible itself consistently makes that very point right along with you. The letter of James, this one we're looking at here, is one of the earliest Christian documents written just 10 or 15 years after Jesus' death and resurrection in the beginning of the church. And one of the first issues that James addresses in this earliest of Christian letters is this very problem. And James is saying nothing that Jesus didn't already say. So I want you to know that we agree, I agree, that's a real concern. But what I also want you to consider is that this does not invalidate the claims of Jesus or the reality that he is the Savior and Lord, and he calls you to follow him. Jesus is the only one who ever lived the truth consistently. He was faithful through and through, and he came to rescue us from our inconsistency. 
So he came as the one who's truly consistent to rescue us. So we are imperfect people clinging, holding on to a perfect Savior. But you can also know this. Some people who look completely inconsistent, who claim to be Christians, may not actually be real Christians. So I want you to have a category for Christians who are more or less inconsistent, and that is at one level a given. No one's going to be perfect. At another level, it's a problem and we need to grow. And I want you to have another category for those who claim to be Christians whose life is so inconsistent with their profession that um, they're not actually real Christians. And what I mean by that is Jesus himself only identified his true family as those who hear and do his word. So he said many who claim him as their Lord, he will say on the last day, I never even knew you. Depart from me. James will say later in this very letter that there is a difference between those who have a faith that has no doing, which he calls a dead faith, They can't save anybody or do anything, and it's useless, and a real faith, a saving faith, a genuine faith that does begin to work itself out in life. In other words, there's a real difference between nominal Christianity and real Christianity. A nominal Christian is a Christian in name only. They claim to be a Christian, but Jesus doesn't actually recognize them as his family. So when you meet one, don't reject Jesus because of that. Recognize that Jesus himself rejects that kind of superficial faith. When someone is a true Christian, they hear and do, not entirely consistently, but they will grow over time because they've been given a new heart and the word's been planted within them. So I invite you then to recognize your own inconsistencies and then join me and join us in coming to Jesus for forgiveness and for the power to change. Second, I want to address inconsistent Christians here. At some level, that's all Christians in this room. In this life, we will all have some kind of gap between the truth we're professing and the life that we're living. But the Christian life is learning to close that gap by the power of the Spirit and God's Word. And this morning is an opportunity to take this seriously in your life. So what we hear on Sunday should lead to a change on Monday. Your coworkers should see that there's real change in your life over time. You are getting less and less inconsistent. Your clients should see that you do seek to put your faith into practice. That if one of them came in here on a Sunday and maybe they didn't know you were a Christian yet and they see you here, they would say something like, oh, that makes sense. This explains some of the out-of-this-world kindness and love and faithfulness in their lives. Maybe you're a Christian in, in school, in high school, and your parents aren't believers. You have an opportunity to show them what it looks like for Christ to change you and to, to live with this consistency in your life. As parents, one of your primary roles is to show your children what it looks like to be a hearer and a doer, not just someone who hears and then wants their kids to be a doer. Many kids grow up in homes with parents who were either inconsistent or perhaps just Christians in name only. They went to church, they prayed before meals, but that was it. There was some hearing and no doing. So how are you doing with this? Maybe you need to let this morning be a turning point for you, where you take the doing much more seriously. Or maybe you need to have a family meeting in your home And you need to acknowledge to your family that you recognize you have significantly failed in this. And with God's strength, you are open to changing. Third, I've been mainly emphasizing the doing. That's the text emphasis. But there is no doing without true hearing. James does not say, just be a doer. And that's Christianity. No, he says we must be hearers, but not hearers only. And we're not just doers but doers of the word. So as much as I've emphasized that we can't merely hear, some of us need to lean in to that starting point this morning. You need to start prioritizing hearing God's word more because this is where the power to change comes from. God speaks to us 
and he transforms us through his word. Now, there's, a lots of what, there's lots of ways that we hear God's word, so we don't reduce that to one thing. So we want to be a word-centered church. We want to have word-centered lives, and hearing God's word is we want it to flow from all aspects of life and the ministries of our church. So obviously, we want the preaching to be an opportunity to hear God's Word. This is why we're committed to expositional preaching, where the goal is not just to hear a message loosely based on the Bible, but to hear the message of God's Word itself. Our scripture reading in the service is a moment to lean in and hear God's very voice to us. Uh, Counseling is applying God's Word to hard situations. Our children's and youth ministries are ways of teaching God's Word to younger people. Our resource center exists to to bring Bible-saturated resources into our lives and conversations. Families, we want to see as places, and some of you do this really well, some of you have an opportunity to grow, find ways to be in God's Word together, to, as a family, let God speak to you through the Bible regularly. We want to encourage one another to be in God's Word every day. Maybe that's not the morning for you. It may be lunch. It may be on your commute. For most of us, probably it would be waking up earlier and carving out that time to do that. Uh, Sermon discussions and Bible study in the midst of small groups is a part of this. There's lots of ways to do this. I want to return for a moment to the centrality of preaching, though, for a moment. I say all that to say we do not reduce the hearing of God's Word in this church to just this moment. That would put too much pressure on this moment anyways, as if this this sermon is supposed to do everything. Um, But it is an important central part Um, of our life of a church. So we talked about this yesterday uh, morning as elders at our retreat. One of the Apostle Paul's final commands, and really the culminating command of his final letter, is at the end of 2 Timothy, and he calls Timothy. Paul's about to leave the scene. He knows he's about to die. The next generation of ministries before him, and he gives this central command with urgency. Three words. Preach the word. So it's a serious command, it's an urgent command, and what does that assume? That's actually not just a command for a preacher. What does it assume about all of us if the Apostle Paul would give this culminating central command to a man like Timothy? You make sure you preach the Word. It assumes that Christians need to hear the preaching of God's Word. So, it assumes that the church is shaped by the preaching of God's Word. So, preaching, what we're doing right here is not an optional part of local church life. This is the very center of our church where we gather as God's people with God's Spirit present, hearing God's revelation to us so we can together in our individual lives and together as a church family hear and respond to God's very word to us. What a privilege. What a sacred reality this is. And we need this every week. I know many of you prioritize this with great intentionality. And you, you are here Sunday after Sunday at great cost. Maybe a vocational shift was needed. Uh, maybe great cost personally and relationally from someone who loves you, doesn't even want you part of a church. Maybe you've made changes or or your family had to miss out on otherwise good opportunities with youth sports or something, so you can prioritize gathering with God's people to hear God's Word together. So I commend you for that. Um, Some of you, I know if you miss a Sunday, you listen to the audio um, so that you're caught up with the sermon series so we can track through the book, or you read the the text uh, ahead of the sermon and take notes when you're here and lean in. But some of you may not think of this as a very important part of your life. You're here when you're in town and when it's generally there's nothing else going on on a Sunday. Over the course of the year, you probably miss a lot more sermons than you think. Um, When you add up vacations, when you add up travel, when you add up even just going out of town with other believers, when you add up being sick or a family member being sick and needing to care for them, other special trips, kids' sporting events. And we recognize that we have attention also because in our church we ask for people to volunteer to bring God's Word to children during the sermon. 
And thank you for those of you who do that and bring the word to those children. It's important. But this is also why we make sure we don't want people to volunteer more than two Sundays every month because we recognize that there's a trade-off here. And if preaching and hearing preaching is central to our church life and for a Christian to grow, then we have to prioritize this together. So there's challenges here. So no one's going to have perfect attendance. I'm not keeping track of whether or not you're here and you know, taking tabs or anything. That's not my point. My point is not to say anything about me as if I'm important and come listen to me. I'm just hesitant to do this because it could come across that way. Not my point at all. Um, Really, a test for me is when the Lord leaves me out of preaching ministry, follow up and see if I am submitting to God's word with radical priority in my life and being not just a hearer and a doer. And look at me on Sundays when I'm not preaching. Am I here? Am I listening? And please know that if I'm not here, I'm often prioritizing hearing the word with my family at another church, or I'm trying to encourage another preacher of God's word who's a friend of mine in the area to hear his word and commend him in that work. So I'm, I'm with you, and I, I, I'm under God's word on Sunday, just as you are. That's my heart here. My point, though, is for us to prioritize God's word, you and I together and to see what's competing with this in our hearts and our lives. Let's end where James does here. He says, the one who hears and then does will be blessed in his doing. What a great word. Overused and thin word in our culture often, but what a great biblical, wonderful word to be blessed in your doing. The church that hears and the person that hears and then does will be blessed. Not just kind of a generic, like, the universe will find blessing into your life. God himself will bless you in your doing. God's blessing is like the warmth of a sun, bringing life and light when we're under it. And the very heart of his word, the revelation of his greatness, his goodness, his glory in Jesus and his grace is coming at us. And he's the one who loves us and invites us to enjoy being loved by him as we hear his word and Enjoy loving him back. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for speaking and being a speaking God. We thank you for not leaving us uh, ignorant of who you are and your love in Christ and the life that you cause us to live and will bless. We pray that you would cause each of us to respond in the ways that each of us needs to, which only you know and only you can actually bring about. So we're looking to you, in Jesus' name.